701, we'll begin the meeting of the Mill Creek Supervisors, uh, February 23rd. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Item number three on the agenda is public comment on agenda items other than development or rezoning applications. Do we have any public comment on agenda items? Being none, we'll move on to the next one. That is the approval of the minutes, the minutes from last uh, meeting, which was February the 9th. Any corrections or additions that we need to make to that? I'll yep. move approval of the minutes for February 9th. Okay. I'll second. Okay, Mr. Morgan. Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I vote yes. Mr. McGrath? Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, item number five on the agenda, approval of the bills. Do we have any questions about the bills? I'll move we pay the bills. Okay. Do I hear a second on that? <clears throat> I'll second. Okay. Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Item number six, public hearing on a land development plan. At Mill Creek Township School District, the new multi-purpose field. It is a land development plan to show the removal of a portion of existing parking lot and the construction of a new multi-purpose athletic field and a 3,755 square foot building, associated parking areas, pedestrian walkways, stormwater management facilities located at the northeast corner of West 38th and Cahey Road. Mr. Del Frat. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Morris. At their meeting of February 2nd, Planning Commission recommended approval, but they noted one requirement and one condition. The requirement is that the school district move the 38th Street sidewalk north as far as possible from the cartway and connect with the existing CBS sidewalk. The condition, provide an easement to the public for any sidewalks constructed on Mill Creek Township School District property. Okay. Tommy, before you start, Rick, what's the reason for that? Why did the Planning Commission suggest that the sidewalk be moved out of the right-of-way? Because it is so close to the north edge of the pavement. Ah. We're afraid that all the snow and ice would bury the sidewalk. And gotcha. it's out of alignment with the stub of CBS <laughs> sidewalk that extends near the property line to their driveway. Okay. It's about five feet short of the property line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mr. Delfra. Um, just to concur with Mr. Morris, we are going to follow through with recommendations. I have actually contacted Baldwin Brothers who own the building at CVS and he has given me verbal permission to okay. uh, go ahead and make the connection. So when we're in there, we're actually just going to make the connection to the CVS sidewalk and not worry about it. Okay. Um, and we are moving it further north as close as we can get to the retaining wall that uh, surrounds the, uh, the field. I do want to make a, a note that the multi-purpose practice in facility is a future project. That is not going to be done in this phase. Okay. Okay. And I don't know. To, okay, we did have some, I did have some things drawn up to, to have it a little bit better if you wanted to. But, Tom, you are going to do the stormwater management as part of this project? All stormwater management for the entire development and entire plan, including the building, uh, will be done. And we are actually running utilities, uh, sewer and water from across Cahi, from the west side of Cahi across to make connections available to us at a time when we might put that building in. Gotcha. Okay. Anybody else to speak on behalf of this land development plan? Anybody? Anybody to speak in regards to any opposition to this plan? None. Any questions from the board? Brian? No. Nope. Anybody? Okay. Okay. Call for a motion to. Uh, to I'll move approval of the land development plan uh, with the requirement and conditions as stated by our township engineer. Okay. Do I hear a second? I will second. Okay. Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan. I vote, I vote yes. Okay, and I vote yes. Okay, that's approved. Uh, number, <coughs> item number seven, the referral to the Planning Commission of a petition requesting a change in zoning classification. 
the Humane Society of Northwest Pennsylvania by Nicole Baywall for property at uh, 2433 Zimmerly Road, now zoned R1 single family residence. Mm -hmm. Uh, and RR residential district asking for a change in classification to C1 local commercial. Uh, we need a motion to get that referred over to the Planning Commission. I'll move to refer it to the Planning Commission. I'll okay. second that. Okay. Give me a second here to, okay. Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I vote yes. Mr. McGrath? Yes. And I vote yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, item number eight on the agenda. Announcement of bids and quotations. I think, Brian, you'll take a lot of these mm -hmm. right off the bat there. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the township opened uh, bids for the aggregates that we use for our paving program. 12,000 tons of bituminous asphalt type 3. Uh, uh, number 8, 1B limestone, 10,000 tons of that, and 2,500 tons of number 57, 2B limestone. But the township <clears throat> typically does is wait to award the, the contract for those items until after we accept bids on the hauling of those items so it's a package deal so that we get the best price possible for both the material and um, the hauling of the material. We opened the bids for the hauling of that material today and uh, the combined totals are as follows. For the 12,000 tons of bituminous asphalt type 3 uh, we received a bid from uh, Cindy Glover Trucking, uh, hauling that material from Fiesler Sand and Gravel, $4.69. From Tim's Maintenance, $3.77. And from Russell Standard Corporation, $5.86 per ton. Again, that's from the, uh, if the material came from Fiesler Sand and Gravel, a Noyle Road. Uh, we also received bids um, on hauling that material from Gertz Sand and Gravel, who, although their uh, their mailing address is Northeast, I believe they're actually in New York State. Um, Cindy Glover Trucking, five dollars and thirty nine cents per ton. Tim's Maintenance, four dollars and ninety cents per ton. And Russell Standard Corporation, six dollars and seventy eight cents per ton. The combined best total for the uh, aggregate and the hauling would be purchasing the material from Gertz Sand and Gravel at $4 per ton and having it hauled by Tim's Maintenance uh, for $4.90 per, per ton for a total of $8.90 per ton. I would move that the uh, uh, award for the purchase of the sand go to Gertz Sand and Gravel and the uh, award for the hauling contract to Tim's Maintenance for $4.90 per ton. Uh, Gertz was for four dollars per ton for the uh, for the sand, okay. and I'll make that in the form of a motion. Okay. Do I hear a second on that motion? I'll second the motion. Okay. Mr. McGrath, I do yes. Vote? Mr. Morgan, I vote yes, and I vote yes too. A little bit easier for uh, ten thousand tons of Ashto number eight one B limestone. Uh, we only received one bid on uh, the material itself from Erie Sand and Gravel for twenty one dollars and thirty four cents per ton. We did receive four bids for hauling the material. Cindy Glover Trucking, $2.55 per ton. Carmuse, Erie Sand and Gravel, $2.75 per ton. Tim's Maintenance, $3.11 per ton. And Russell Standard Corporation, $2.90 per ton. Um, Cindy Glover Trucking would be the low bid, combined bid um, of $24.29 when you combine the cost of the material and the trucking. I would move that uh, Erie Sand and Gravel be awarded the contract for the 10,000 tons of 1B limestone and Cindy Glover Trucking be awarded the hauling contract at 255 per ton. Okay, do we hear a second on that? I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. <clears throat> Similar bids for uh, 2,500 tons of number 57 2B limestone. Erie Sand and Gravel again bid $20, $21.74 per ton. Trucking, again, all the same. Cindy Glover Trucking, 255. Carmuse, 275. Tim's Maintenance, 311. And Russell Standard, $2.90 per ton. Uh, the combined best bid would be from uh, Cindy Glover Trucking and, of course, uh, Erie Sand and Gravel for the material. Uh, I would move that 
the award go to Carmus for the Tubi Limestone at 2174 and Cindy Glover Trucking for 255 per ton for the Tubi Limestone. Okay, and that is in the form of a That's motion. A motion. Okay, do I hear a second on that? I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath, how do yes. you vote? Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I vote yes. And I also vote yes. Okay. Trees. Okay. We have several uh, tree removals. Uh, this is from uh, Pam Fitzpatrick in the Streets Department. Um, first is for tree and stump on uh, corner of Summer and High Street. Three quotes were received from Dibble Tree Service, um, $900. Jake Thomas Tree Service, $485. Jefferson Tree Service, $600. And I would move that uh, Jake Thomas uh, do that work for $485. Okay. That is the that's a motion. Motion there. Yep. Okay. Do we hear a second on that? Well, I, I have one question, yeah. uh, Mr. McGrath. Uh, there's some discussion about possibly rebidding that. Are we, are we looking into that? Have you talked to Pam about? I talked to Pam not about rebidding or getting new quotes for all of these, um, but in the future we're going to put them together as a package, okay. unless they're an emergency. None of these were an emergency. Sure. But in the future, on occasion, we run into. A situation where the tree has to, you know, it's in danger of falling or a limb right. falling or whatever. That would not uh, have to wait for a group, but uh, Pam is going to see about getting four or five or six of them at a time and doing this when they're non non emergencies. Okay. So yes, we are going to do that. I'll, I'll I'll second the motion. Okay, Mr. McGrath. How yes. You vote? Mr. Morgan. I'll vote yes. And I vote yes. Next is for again tree and stump removal at 2330 West 34th Street. Uh, Dibble Tree Service, $2,850. Jake Thomas, $3,490. And Jefferson Tree, $1,500. And I would move the Jefferson Tree Service uh, do that work. Okay, we'll hear a second on that. Uh, I second, and again, just note that in the future we'll try and yeah. group these bids together. Well, you noted. Okay. Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and I vote yes. I'm sorry about that. I didn't know you were taking no a sip problem. of your coffee. Okay. Number three. Uh, this is for a tree at Asbury and Old Saratania. Dibble Tree Service, $550. Jake Thomas did not respond. Jefferson Tree Service, $525. And uh, I would move that the low quote for Jefferson do that work. Okay, do I hear a second on that? I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. And finally, with the trees, uh, 2706 Fiesler, Dibble. $1,000, Jake Thomas, $1,225, and Jefferson Tree Service, $975. I would move that Jefferson do that work. Okay, do I hear a second on that? I'll vote. Uh, I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath? Yes. And Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Okay, next one. That's very barn. You want to take a little break there or something? No, okay. Okay. I'll, take, I'll take a sip of water. Okay. Okay. Sip of water or something? <laughs> okay, uh, in this year's budget, we do have. Uh, an item for resurfacing the second floor of Asbury Barn. Um, Ashley Marstell, our Parks and Rec Director, was able to obtain two quotes on that work. Dana Floor Sanding Incorporated, incorporated $4,930. Janitor Supply, $9,565. Erie Floors did not wish to um, provide a quote. I would move that uh, Dana Floor Sanding Incorporated be awarded that uh, contract for $4,930. Okay, do I hear a second on that? I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Okay, okay. keep Next on going. One. Yep, keep on, you're on a roll. Uh, this is for repairing a return line at the Bell Valley Pool, the small pool in Bell Valley. Again, this was a budgeted item. Uh, Ashley tried to obtain three quotes. She was only successful and obtaining one from Collie's uh, Pools for $7,375. She also contacted Motch Plumbing and North Coast Pool and Spa. So I would move that Collie's be awarded that contract for $7,375. Okay, do I hear a second on that? I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Okay, from Bill Hitchcock in the garage, uh, would like to purchase a hot water pressure washer. This is for the uh, crews at the east side garage so they can clean the salt trucks primarily. Uh, 
Bill obtained three quotes, ADMAR, $3,719.41. That includes freight. Uh, Circo Industrial Supply, $3,895.14 plus freight. Uh, and Granger, $7,154.10. He doesn't mention freight, but they were quite a bit higher anyways. Uh, so I would move that Admar, or that we purchase the uh, pressure washer from Admar for $3,719.41. Okay, we'll hear a second on that. I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes, too. Okay, next is another budgeted item of a new truck uh, bed and uh, snow plow. This is uh, through the CoStars program. CoStars is a joint purchasing program provided by the, the state of Pennsylvania. It's an excellent program and we use it frequently. Um, the uh, cab and chassis would be coming from Five Star International. Uh, the CoStars price for 2016 is $90,300.11. Sense. Uh, the uh, dump body and plow equipment would be coming from uh, U.S. Municipal, again a CoStars contract for $67,483. And like I mentioned, this is a uh, budgeted item and it actually was a 1.16% less expensive uh, item than, than uh, the previous year. Uh, just uh, for the record, the CoStars contract for the uh, for the uh, cabin chassis is 025-005. The contract, the CoStars contract for the uh, dump body is 025-019. And I'll move approval of that purchase. Okay, do I hear a second on that? I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Sticking with the theme. You'll get a break here. In the Memos place. from the garage. Again, from Bill Hitchcock, he would like to purchase a uh, combined compressor generator welder. Um, he obtained three quotes. He did mention that one of the quotes was not for what he was, uh, it's a smaller unit than what he uh, desired for whatever reason. The, uh, the company that Havis, who, vote, who uh, supplied the quote, did not. Uh, provide the, uh, the quote on the item that he was looking for. Uh, Admar, $8,002.94. Granger, $9,408.60. And from Havis, $5,796.10. Again, that was not the um, size compressor that Bill was looking for. Bill's recommendation is that we purchase the uh, unit from Admar again for eight thousand two dollars and ninety four cents. I'll move approval of that. Okay. Do I hear a second on that? I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan, I vote yes. And I vote yes. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Next item number nine, resolution two thousand sixteen R dash eight. It is a resolution to appoint voting delegates for the Erie County Tax Collection Committee. Um, can just handle this. I don't, does Evan doesn't need to handle this. No. No. Okay. The resolution, uh, uh, whereas Act 32 requires governing bodies of school districts, townships, boroughs, and cities to impose an in, earn income tax to appoint one voting delegate and one or more alternates to the tax collection committee as representatives, whereas the Mill Creek Township does impose an earned income tax and desires to appoint the required delegates, whereas the individuals have consented to appointment as delegates and alternate. Uh, first of all, here's what it's resolved as. Primary voting delegate is Mark Chaheski, our township treasurer. Uh, the second, or the first alternate voting delegate would be myself as chairman. And the second uh, alternate voting delegate would be Brian McGrath as vice chairman. Uh, number four, if the vote, voting delegate cannot be president for the TCC, the first alternate voting delegate shall be the rep. If both uh, the primary voting delegate and the first alternate cannot be president, present, the second alternate voting delegate shall be the representative. Uh, these appointments uh, are effective immediately and shall continue until successors are appointed. Uh, delegates shall be appointed each year at the township's organizational meeting or soon thereafter. Uh, of course, this would be adopted if we approve it, uh, adopted today. Uh, make that in a form of a motion. I'll make that motion if you don't mind. I'll second it. Okay. 
Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I vote yes. Mr. Mr. McGath? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Item number 10. This one I'm going to refer over to, uh, to Evan Adair, our township solicitor. Mr. Adair, can you shed some light on this one here? It's an agreement to, with Mill Creek Water Authority to assign claims and liens. Uh, this agreement uh, flows from a resolution that the supervisors adopted at their meeting two weeks ago, and it's in keeping with the winding up of affairs for mm -hmm. the Mill Creek Water Authority. And again, I, I mentioned it the last meeting, I'll say it again. The ratepayers of the Mill Creek Water Authority are going through a transition, uh, and they're going to experience something they haven't experienced before in terms of billing, and we need to make folks aware that Erie Water Works, which will issue bills sometime in the first quarter of 2016, mm -hmm. will not include in their bills delinquent balances the customers might owe for service prior to the 18th of December, I believe it was. That, those balances are due to the Mill Creek Water Authority, and as Mill Creek Water Authority winds down its affairs, our agreement with the authority is that when it gets to a point probably around March 18th, where the authority is supposed to terminate its affairs, it will assign to Mill Creek Township its rights as to all receivables as well as all funds. Receivables include assessments that have not been paid at that point. Now some of these assessments will be leaned in court, meaning paper liens will be filed in the court to confirm the fact that money is due. The assessments are really liens in and of themselves. The, this agreement provides for the assignment by the authority to the township of all the authority's interest in the claims and in any liens that are filed. We don't know exactly how many liens are going to be filed. There, it could be hundreds of unpaid assessments, and if it's that big a number, we're probably going to have to work with the authority to figure out how many should really be liened and how many we should just bill again and, and trust the people will pay in short order without excess formality. But this agreement really provides details as to how we're going to handle the assignment to the township of the authority's interest in the unpaid receivables as of about a month from now. And I would recommend its adoption. Okay. Well, I hear a motion to approve that. I would move approval of the agreement uh, between Mill Creek Township Water Authority uh, and the township to assign liens or assign claims and liens. Okay. Do I hear a second on that motion? I'll second. Okay. Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Item number 11, Stormwater Maintenance Agreement, uh, Erie Commerce LLC. Mr. Morris. Stormwater Management Maintenance Agreement is on the standard approved form. The developer will become the owner and will be responsible for everything. So I recommend approval of the agreement. Okay. Well satisfied on that. Any questions from the board? I'll move approval. Okay. Do I hear a second on that? And Mr. Morris responded. Clarify this is a standard agreement that we enter into with developers? Yes. I will second. Okay. Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Next item, number 12, communications. Mark. Wait, do I have the right one there? No. No, no, no. What's that again? Mark had nothing. Okay, Mark had nothing. Okay. Brian. Back to me. Yep. Okay, first is uh, spring seasonal staff approvals, and we do have two pages. I'm not going to read everybody's name, but just one slight change from uh, what's on the list. Um, we, uh, we are going to, or I'm going to uh, move approval of the list uh, with the exception of two employees uh, who we've been discussing uh, along with a few at the recycling center, John Bucci and Gary Obawanek. Uh, we would like to get uh, job descriptions for these um, adult part-time part employees and then we could make the job descriptions uh, or make their wages part of the job description so I would uh, move approval of this list of uh, seasonal employees for the Parks and Rec Department uh, with the exception of those two employees uh, at least for the okay. until the next meeting hopefully okay we hear a second on that I'll second that okay mr. McGrath I yes vote. mr. Morgan I vote yes and I vote yes. Okay. Uh, uh, emission certification. Okay. Uh, again, from Bill Hitchcock, uh, he would like permission to send Larry Manis and Andy Tucholsky 
to the OBD2 recertification class to be held on Wednesday, April 30th, beginning at 3.30 p.m. Uh, the fee for the class is $55 per person, and I would move approval of that. Okay, do I hear a second on that? I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Okay, so, that's all you got yep. there? Okay, uh, I've got a memo from uh, Police Director Mike Tesor. Dear sir, I respectfully request that the Milk Creek Board of Supervisors approve the following at public meeting February 23rd. Uh, number one is the purchase of one Nikon D3200 camera with a three lens kit from Red Tag Camera, one Nikon AFS DX zoom lens from Red Tag Camera, and one Nikon AFS zoom lens from Kenmore Camera via eBay at a total cost of $2,296.85. I ask this purchase be made from funds donated by the American Legion Post 773. Uh, currently, two of the three crime scene processing cameras are in disrepair, while the requested lenses will work interchangeably with the remaining camera and the proposed for purchase camera. Uh, he attached the quotes on that there. I think everybody had a chance to look at those. So I, I'll make a motion to approve that purchase of that camera and the accessories. I'll Here's second it. Okay. Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Okay. And let's see here. I was a little bit remiss here. I'm sorry. I wanted to uh, welcome all the students here from McDowell High School. I should have done it at the beginning of the meeting there. Uh, in case you didn't know, this is one of your fellow classmates here sitting over here, Caitlin McLaughlin. And uh, she's our student ambassador uh, serving on the on the Board of Supervisors, um, and uh, we welcome her, of course. She started our last meeting, and uh, if you feel the desire to, to do this sometime, uh, to get a hold of your guidance counselor. I think Andrea Nusserino is the one handling all of this, so if you wanted to do that. So just wanted to point that out. Sorry for being late at bringing that up there. Uh, I do have something that um, may sound a little bit uncomfortable to talk about, and it's rather odd that I'm going to, but I'm going to have to do it anyway, set the record straight. Uh, in case you haven't been following the news during the past two weeks, there's been some controversy regarding the, the award of unemployment benefits to a former township employee or township supervisor. In the midst of the controversy is a two-to-one vote by the board on February 9th to appeal the award with myself being in the minority. I have received numerous calls and emails regarding my vote and somehow the perception has been perpetuated by some in the media that I support the former supervisor's application for unemployment. The fact is, I don't. However, there is a loophole in unemployment laws and the second class township code, which makes this scenario very possible. I have known this loophole exists for quite a long time, and I think many of those who know township government know it does too. I believe there's a matter of equal importance, and that has to do with the employee information being shielded from the public under Act 3 of 2008, also known as a right to know law which further implies it is also being shielded from discussion during public meetings, as it was during that meeting on February 9th. Although they haven't published that fact, the Times knows that this is once again because they were denied access to documents regarding the alleged pay benefits paid to another former township supervisor. You didn't read that in today's newspaper. Uh, they requested information regarding another supervisor and were denied it under the right to know law. Uh, nothing was mentioned about that, but I can bet there will be an editorial in Sunday's paper about our lack of transparency, blah, 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 blah. Contrary to what the readers have may have read in the past two weeks, the Times wrote that I lacked transparency or I was irked in regard to my request for executive session. The fact remains that information is not for the public, whether through documentation or conversation during a public meeting. It all comes down to a very simple premise. If you cannot publicly reveal the documents regarding a certain matter, it is not for public discussion. Both the right to know law and the sunshine laws make it improper for such matters to be public information. I'm not sure if I can state it any other easier than it if it's not for the public to know, it is not for us to discuss in public. However, the cat is out of the bag, as they say in this matter, and who knows where it'll end up. I'm sure there are some who will disagree with my point of view, including certain writers and editors of the Times, which for some reason only wish to tell part of the story and use rumor and innuendo to fill in where the truth is not known, or in my case, not asked. That, of course, is my opinion, and that brings the journalism to a newer shade of yellow. However, here are a few questions we have to consider, gentlemen. 
And I think we really have to look at this honestly. And as I said, I do not think it is right that Mr. Fagaski has applied for unemployment. But I gotta ask ourselves here, and this, I don't want answers right now, but I want the public to know this here too. What are the driving motivations behind this proposed appeal? Is it closing a loophole? Is it Mill Creek politics as usual? Is it making a story? Is it man of the people syndrome? I don't know. Uh, in regards to closing that loophole, Mr. Morgan has taken the step, and I agree, of contacting State Representative Ryan Bizarro. I would also suggest that the matter be brought up at the PSATS convention in April, because this is something that has some impact. It's a state law under second class code versus unemployment law, uh, so it goes on and on and on. Uh, I think that starting it with ECATO, uh, we need to get a resolution on the floor to support that if it's ever going to get, be changed at the state level. Brian, you were on the resolutions committee, I believe. Yes. Okay. So I think well, and, and someone and has to grow. I, I'll be attending Cato's meeting on Thursday. Right. I do plan okay. I think if we're going to be serious about this, we need to do this. Uh, also, another question I have to ask: What is it we're trying to achieve? What is the end game that we're trying to come up with? The conclusion to this: Do we want to win this appeal, or do we just want to slap Rick around a little bit? I don't know. By the way, Rick is a big boy and can handle himself quite well. I'm more concerned about how we handle this whole thing, and that does matter to me. Another question, how far are we willing to go? Is this a half-baked attempt to correct an injustice or make a matter worth taking it to the limit? On a side note, if I'm going to fight something, I prefer to be sure of winning. According to the township labor solicitor, he isn't sure. At least that's what I have been told by our HR director. Keep in mind, Here's something else I want you to everybody to think about here. Keep in mind, if this the matter goes further, it will cost more. How much do we wish to spend in this appeal? Although I doubt it, it could go as far as the PA Supreme Court. It could if the, appeal, if the parties wanted to appeal it that far. And just one little side note, if you remember last year, we terminated an employee with just cause, and it was an open and shut case. The legal bill on that was $19,600 to fight that unemployment. And we weren't successful in it there. But the point is how much money it costs to fight it. As I said in the beginning of all of this, the answers to all these will be very evident when the thing is concluded. All I ask is that we refrain from discussing this matter, revealing any more information, or I think we will probably find ourselves in trouble with the law. I think we need to comply with the right to know law and also the executive session law, despite whatever anybody at the Times News has to say about it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. John, we still have this for the police department. There's one more on there. But okay. I don't want to. Okay. That. Thank you. Um, just to address uh, a little bit of what you uh, just spoke about there, John, as far as motivation, uh, when I brought this up two weeks ago, um, it's pretty simple, actually. Um, okay. The, I believe that Mr. Pagaski was wrong in filing for unemployment uh -huh. because of the way he. Uh, left office. He, right. I, I understood that what has been discussed no in the media, no that, disagreement. that uh, if you are defeated, that uh, there's a lot of precedent all through the state that uh, a defeated candidate uh, who was a township employee would be eligible for workers' compensation. Mm -hmm. And that's why in the past, in the more recent past, the township has chosen not to um, oppose the granting of unemployment compensation. Right. In this case, it was somewhat different in that um, the former supervisor made it well known that he was not going to seek re-election and chose um, obviously okay. not to run. Right. So I, I drew a distinction last week or two mm -hmm. weeks ago. I, I still think that that distinction is quite obvious. Okay. And I think that if we would not have mm -hmm. um, opposed the granting of uh, workers' compensation, that it obviously would not have been withdrawn, it would have been granted, um, mm -hmm. and it would have set, set precedent, perhaps throughout the state, yep. that a township employee who does not seek re-election would be eligible for, mm -hmm. for uh, unemployment right. compensation. Maybe that precedent already exists. Yep. Maybe you're right, John, and maybe we're, 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 yep. this is an open and shut case, yep. and we're going to lose hands down, well, and that may very well be, but I think that uh, yeah. on the matter of principle that the township needed to 
oppose the granting of right. Of, uh, and there's no disagreement from me. There is no disagreement and, from me on that. Mr. Girl, the executive uh, session is what I was asking about. This is information sure. that should have been held in a different meeting setting. Well, and Mr. Girl, I'll, I'll, I do agree on that point. At the time, and I, I did have conversations with you, Mr. McGrath, prior to that meeting, mm -hmm. um, stating that we, we should challenge and that right. um, due to the unique nature of very, Mr. Vygotsky's em, em, yeah. employment due to second class township code mm -hmm. and employment compensation law that should have been held in executive session. But I, I do believe Mr. McGrath is correct that uh, because it was discussed in public, I believe it did impact uh, the Unemployment Compensation Board decision to vacate that decision, mm -hmm. uh, which essentially reset the board and, and perhaps will put us on a path of, of a new precedent um, that okay. supervisors do resign, will not receive unemployment okay. compensation. Uh, you, you mentioned my, my outreach to Representative Bizarro's yes. office. I have heard I back that. from yes. the Representative's Chief of Staff, mm -hmm. and initial conversations seem to indicate that um, the legal team that the state representative's office has available to them and their contacts in employment compensation board are actually rather surprised that our past supervisors have been awarded. Uh, so it may not be common practice. It may be uh, a unique item here to Erie County that may be able to be corrected administratively at the UC board. And, and again, this conversation may not have, have reached the level necessary to in, in impact the discussions. Uh, if, if not for Mr. McGrath bringing up in public, which mm -hmm. is regrettable, but, but may turn out uh, for the good right. in the end. Right, and uh, the fact is, you know, we are going to appeal the matter. That's already been sta stated for the record. And, there. and also, uh, uh, one more point that I'd like to quickly make here. Mm -hmm. um, in order for us to appeal this and to use the uh, services of our labor attorney, we would have had to appro approve that at a meeting. Right. Um, so one way or the other, it was gonna come up at a public meeting perhaps mm -hmm. not to the extent that it was discussed last week, but at some point, one way or another, we were gonna have to vote to utilize, to utilize the, the services, services of, of our to labor file attorney it, you know, to file that appeal. File an appeal and, against um, the, the award of UC benefits to a is, former employee. Which is, uh, and John Morgan, you make a good point. Yeah. I don't know whether without the amount of media attention that this issue received, I don't know whether the Unemployment Compensation Board would have even okay. addressed it. It may okay. have just, well, gone by the wayside and we would have had a hearing and Mr. Okay. Gaskin would have gotten his unemployment. Yeah. Let me just summarize it up this way if I can. Uh, we are still waiting to hear back from the unemployment board uh, under their, their review, their second review of that. And I guess the question is that we need to sit down and have a strategy session to determine just where we're going, depending on how that thing goes. We need to, if yeah. and when we get that uh, one yeah. way or the other, we yeah. It's been over a week now, and I'm hoping that we hear something soon. We'll and need to sit down. We will need to sit down. Uh, back per X and find out what he thinks. Hopefully in executive session. Well, yeah, we wouldn't do that. At, I figured that much. Game. Okay. <laughs> one thing I forgot to mention here, this is from the police department. Uh, uh, item number two here, the chief or the uh, director of police is asking for permission to send patrolman Mike, uh, Matt Schollenberger and Mike Inman to attend a class entitled or titled Technical Collision Investigation at the Pennsylvania State Police Training Institute uh, in Meadville, uh, May 16th through May 27th. This is an advanced class which will require, which will further educate these officers in methods and techniques of motor vehicle accident investigation. There is no registration fee, no additional cost will be incurred with their attendance, and the, no overtime is scheduled because of this right here. Uh, it may happen because of somebody calling off or something like that, but it's not intended to spur overtime. So I make a motion to get that approved there. I'll second it. Okay, Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Okay, that's all I have there, thank you. Mr. Morgan, do you have anything for you? Uh, yes, I wanted to report out on the MPO meeting that occurred uh, last week on February 17th. Um, as you gentlemen uh, yeah, are we aware, the Erie Metropolitan Planning Organization is a board of local elected officials and transportation professionals that uh, advises and uh, approves uh, PennDOT's capital budget uh, in Erie County. Uh, I want to let you, you guys know that last week uh, our representative, uh, Thomas C. Hoffman, was elected uh, chair of that committee, uh, and I was actually elected vice chair of the committee. So uh, Tom and I are working hard to make sure Mill Creek's interests are represented on the board. So we stacked the deck. We yeah. Well, we, we did not. We, you know, I, I'll tell you what. Uh, <laughs> Tom and I were both nominated by the city of Erie, and we were both uh, seconded by PennDOT. So All right. uh, 
Did you hear a train coming or something right after that? <laughs> So I, I, I appreciate that the city and Penda have faith in Mr. Hoffman and myself to be the chair and vice chair. Okay. Uh, at that meeting, uh, what was discussed was the transportation improvement program. Uh, for your benefit and benefit the audience, um, PennDOT operates on a four-year capital budget for all the transportation uh, projects that are funded by federal and state dollars. Uh, the, that capital budget is being updated this year. Uh, the last meeting was the uh, first uh, really debate that the MPO had over setting that budget. The one thing that uh, myself and the city engineer uh, brought up was that we should be allocating those federal dollars to uh, local projects. We do have several uh, local routes in Erie County. Uh, we have about 35 miles worth of local roads that are eligible for federal dollars. The city has about 70 some and we are pushing for the MPO to allocate funds to local federal aid routes to assist the municipalities with those projects. Uh, what you have before you is, is a list of projects that myself and our engineer, Rick Morris, submitted to PennDOT. Uh, the four prime priorities we have, uh, one of them being a, a safety concern on Perry Highway, uh, the other uh, more so related to a flooding issue over on North Cross Road uh, on the state system. Yeah. We also submitted a project to improve the safety hazard that we've, we've uh, experienced, unfortunately, with, with two fatalities in Mill Creek on uh, Peach Street near Coons Road. And we also put in uh, one, of those, one of those local federal aid routes I mentioned previously uh, for consideration. Uh, we've been pushing that. I think there's some progress on, on that. And hopefully, at our next meeting in May, uh, we'll see the Transportation Improvement Program and include some of our priorities. I just want to report out to you, gentlemen, let you know how that, how that meeting went. So okay. I'm feeling good that we'll be able to get uh, one or two of those four projects uh, put on the tip okay. this time around. Okay. Well, congratulations on your, your vice presidency there. Thank you very much. To, yes. <laughs> Thank you very you much. You represent Milka very well on that there. Thank you. Anything else you got there? Uh, well, we did have uh, an issue that came up about four weeks ago at our meeting. Um, as you gentlemen are aware, uh, the, the township, in, in order to satisfy a lien and, and some other uh, development issues regarding uh, water lines and tax issues, acquired a, a parcel that we commonly call the Lori property, a 15-acre parcel off of Coons Road. At the meeting about four weeks ago, uh, there was some discussion. Uh, we do have uh, an encroachment on the property from a neighboring parcel um, uh, through, through some kind of error in the past. Uh, a, a structure was built, a garage that crosses the property line. And we need to resolve that encroachment uh, in order for us to market our property and also for our neighbor to be able to market their property. Uh, at that meeting, there was some discussion. As a result, Mr. Adair did issue a letter to that property owner uh, proposing a possible solution uh, from the township, uh, that being uh, to subdivide about 2,310 square feet of the parcel we currently own uh, to transfer over to the neighboring property to address that encroachment issue. Uh, in order for both properties to meet our current um, land development ordinances. Uh, that property owner did, did contact me last week to express that they were uh, in agreement over that, that, uh, that, that possible solution. Um, that property owner has also been in contact with our land development coordinator, Matt Waldinger. Uh, I believe we are on a path to have a resolution on this matter. Uh, so what I did is I, I submitted those drawings to uh, the county assessment office. One of the things we've been discussing is how to value uh, that particular residual parcel. Uh, Scott Maas, the manager of the county assessment office, did give us a response. I believe you have that in your packet. Essentially saying that the, uh, the assessed tax value of that small tract of land would be about $270. Uh, I understand there's certain processes we have to go through, but what I would like to do this evening is to at least make a motion uh, to establish the, the price we'll be asking for that uh, piece of property from our uh, from the neighboring property owner will be $270, with the understanding that uh, all subdivision fees and realty fees associated with that sale will be the responsibility of the neighboring property owner who will be purchasing it from us. I'd, I'd like to make that as a motion. Okay. But before we have anything else on that, uh, Mr. Adair, can I defer to you? Are we following procedure on this? I don't want to find ourselves getting behind a jam on this. Well, one. I mean, what you're basically doing is, is saying there's a price you're willing to, to take mm -hmm. in return for the property okay. under, I guess, a reason, commercially reasonable agreement that you and the the neighbor could, could agree to, okay. which would 
it uh, pertain in part to the neighbors being responsible for the costs of securing the subdivision plat approval. Right. I, something tells me the neighbors in the room. Is the neighbor in the room? I believe so. Well, I mean, the reason I'm, I'm not doing this to be contentious, but part of this, and to, you know, maybe it's good that you're here, is this is one of these deals that Mr. Morris refers to as involving the integration rule, or integral rule, which doesn't exist, by the way. Uh, what does <laughs> exist is the fact that we're talking about a lot that is not a standalone lot. It, has, it couldn't be legal unless it's attached to your property. So this is like a multi-layered thing here. We would need to create this little strange looking parcel right. by a subdivision. The subdivision could be approved only on the condition that it became an integral part of your property, which would occur once the subdivision was approved by a deed being done by your attorney that combined this parcel with the parcel you already own. So I mean, it's, that's the multi-layered part. Right. Nothing you can't do, but there's a lot of technical stuff. And you can check this out, but the firm that did the survey work for you before, and I'm not saying who's good, who's bad. I'm saying you've already spent so much money. They have the meets and bounds already. Oh, right. That's probably the least expensive way for you to go because they'll just, once there's a written agreement that says, here's what it's going to be, that firm will create a subdivision based on what that agreement says. But they've already got all meets and bounds in their computer. So I think it's made a lot cheaper for you than if you go to oh, right. Evan Adair surveying and, and that guy has to start all over. Okay. So I, you know, that's why I mentioned that you, know, you already got something in the hopper. They, they have computers no matter what they tell you. All that data is in a computer right. and they will not have to reinvent the wheel if you go back and say, I'd like to tweak this thing. And that will help you in the deed you need to do after the approval as well. Because he'll need to give you a description right. for your parcel with that addition. Okay. okay. Right. And, and, and again, um, this is just uh, what we've been trying to work out is really the easiest possible solution to, to remedy this problem um, so that both parties can be able to move forward as quickly as possible. Um, as Mr. Adair stated, this is, this is uh, a unique situation with this parcel. Um, Very and, unique. Um, Scott Moss, again from the County Assessment Office, um, basically stated it's, it's really near, nearly a valueless parcel because of the situation we're in right now. Um, so I believe that the 270, uh, the, which is what Mr. Moss determined would be the, um, the uh, basically the reduction in the assessed value of our 15 acre parcel were, right. were we to part with this 2300 some square feet piece. I think yeah. it's a fair price. Um, so I would okay. again move that we set that as the value. Okay. Again, with the understanding that um, all the fees for, for uh, subdivision costs, realty transfer costs, all, all those sorts of things would be uh, the purchase responsibility. And I would further move that to authorize the appropriate township staff to uh, move forward with this sale as soon as, as is feasible. Okay. Do I hear a second I'll on that second one? That. Okay. Mr. Morgan, how do you vote on that? I vote yes. Mr. McGrath? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. 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 Well, anything else? Oh, Mr. Adair. The, somebody's going to have to contact you. Would you prefer that we contact the attorney? Well, no, you need to tell us because you, you have a lawyer, and I can't write to you unless you say, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay. Okay. Duly okay. noted. Okay. Thanks, Evan. Okay. Anything else you got there, Mr. Morgan? I believe that's all I have. Okay. How about the building report? You want to do that now? Oh, I'll let later? you handle that. I don't know oh, if, okay. I, if I'm familiar later. enough with it. Okay. Caitlin, any comments, questions? No. Okay. Say hello, Bechdel Trojans, or anything like that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Evan, anything else? I have nothing. Okay. Cheryl? Well, Rick? I'll let you uh, handle the building report, John. You're a little familiar than I am at this uh, point. Not really, but uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Rick, you had nothing you said? Okay. Right. Uh, we have the January 2016 building construction report. Uh, believe me, there's not a lot, act, a lot of activity going on out there. Nothing in residential. Uh, in the commercial end of it, there is a total construction value of $395,000. Uh, the zoning permit fees generated from that are $2,350.
If you want a copy of this, it's online on the township website, or if you want a paper copy, uh, stop by the zoning office tomorrow morning and they will gladly give you one. Okay, uh, citizens to be heard. We have any citizens to be heard? If you would, I know you've been here before. If you state your name. And uh, my name is Gary Bear from 345 Fighter Drive. Yes. Two things. Uh, one would be uh, YouTube. Your link to YouTube yeah. to show the supervisors meeting. Mm -hmm. Does it work? The link, from our, it? The link from our website? Is yeah, from your website. Oh. Yeah, I always go off your website. Okay. You've got other videos, but you don't show anything about your last meeting up there at all. Well, we have two. Two links, we have two YouTube channels. Oh. One, one that's the Judy handles, and then we have the one strictly for the meetings. There's, that was it's established last year. They're supposed to be on the website, right? I believe it's so. supposed to be links from the website. Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. Yeah, we can, we can, okay. we can talk we'll to our IT we'll guy and make sure that link's working. Yeah, yeah we'll see what's going on. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. The, okay. The, the meetings are, are on YouTube. Okay, if you've they seen are. them, I haven't been able to find them. Okay. Okay. So I'll check with Judy, thank you. Okay. Second thing is, I, in the past here, I've heard that, uh, you know, the asphalt plan needs to be looked at. So a couple of candidates who have been running for office in the past have said, well, let's look at that. And I look at it as, this is a perfect storm. What do we have here? We've got a data-driven MBA, CPA. We've got three road masters. We've got a transportation certified planner. We've got an outstanding engineering group. <laughs> Are we going to throw a pebble in the water to see if that with all its ramifications. Now, I understand there's labor, there's this, there's site cleanup potentially, there's back office stuff, there's specs, there's all kinds of good stuff. Uh, would you like to consider doing a study on that? Yeah, it's and interesting. And not, to, not for this year, because it's too short, I mean, obviously, but for the future, for 2017 or later. I, I actually, I, if you guys don't mind, um, I, I was just thinking that today while I was sitting in on, on my first bid opening today for the aggregate we're purchasing for the asphalt plant. Um, I actually, I think this year, right now, is actually a perfect time to start that. At the very least, start tracking the direct costs related to the asphalt plant and our paving schedule. Um, I think it would be appropriate to track the costs of the materials we're purchasing, to start tracking the uh, utility costs of maintaining the asphalt plant, and also to track this year our labor costs for our paving projects so that we can have all of those costs uh, assembled and itemized uh, for next year's budget to, to see if the paving we are performing in, in the township is competitive with the private sector. I, I agree with you entirely. We need to make sure that if whatever products we are providing, for the, whatever services we're providing for the township, make sure they are competitive with uh, private contractors. And what I what I found, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm relatively new. Maybe I haven't looked in the right places yet. Um, we don't seem to be really itemizing those kinds of things, especially when you look at the kind of the, the, the hidden costs of equipment devaluation and also uh, the actual labor costs, the opportunity of having our, our own crew do paving instead of other possible maintenance, maintenance items throughout the township. Uh, I, I would like for us to start tracking that. I'm going to have a meeting with, with Gary Walters, our streets manager, yeah. shortly to start tracking that. And I, I do think it's something that the public should know. And uh, I would hope that the services we're providing are actually cost effective, and, but we should be able to give the public numbers to justify that. I, I'll, I'm thinking of a study more than just cost effective, you know, because when you look at this, uh, any project like that, any activity like that, there's outsourcing, there's uh, in a real world, mm -hmm. and, and you have background costs, you have spec costs, you need engineering costs, you need inspectors to check the work. You, yeah. And you're a, a vice president on that capital outlays project for PennDOT or whatever that's called. Right. And how would that work? You know, if we utilize their specs, their process to award things, uh, a rationalizing of government resources, that would take a chunk of cost away. Uh, our labor, mm -hmm. what we do with them, our assignment, uh, what would that mean to the potholes? Right. I use potholes generally saying that street repairs, not new street information or complete repaving, but repairs. So this, this can't be just, in my mindset, a superficial, just a cost thing, because I think that's a financial game that should be easily to perceive and look out and backtrack, come out of mm -hmm. taking averages and whatever you want to do. But Absolutely. Specifically, you do it. Right. So I know there's going to be another study potentially here for uh, water maintenance or what that uh, storm maintenance yeah. that was reported on. Uh, oh, yeah, you, you're not mistaken. But I, I think the first thing we have to do is actually quantify and track and itemize what our own costs are so you know, we, we know what we're comparing ourselves to. 
and then to look at what opportunities we have to, to reallocate those resources, to reallocate those labor costs uh, to, other, to other projects and bid out the paving project. I mean, but we, we have to make sure that, um, yeah, look, you're absolutely right. I guess we, you, you can massage the numbers. I wouldn't want to. I want to have an honest evaluation well, a, of, of our services. Too, but my thing is that what would you do if that antiquated plant, which I've been told, really sure. that, and I know, uh, Brian, you have a lot of experience with the plant, so you know much better than I'll ever know. But I'm thinking, what would happen if catastrophically it collapsed? It, you can't refurbish some of those parts. It's no longer available. What about your cycle times of getting in and out to cover the roads, get the material moving? Where would it happen? What's the queuing theory going to be here? Mm -hmm. All that good stuff. Now, if that, to me, that says, well, that's important. Right. And I, and I think it should right, be done now. And I think now is really the time to, again, start kind of a new, maybe a new process and procedure. If it's not already in place, I'm just not aware of it, um, to start tracking those costs. So, so we this can, is the team right here? Oh, I think so. I could show you reports, and I'd be happy to share them with you, John. When, when I would, and I did this for a number of years, maybe ten or more, where I would do a cost per ton analysis of the of the material that was produced here at the township, and I would include things like insurance and and um, uh, utilities and depreciation, anything that I could possibly think of to include in the cost per ton was put in, yeah. um, and it came out typically for those 10 or so years that I did the study, about 15% savings. That included the labor and everything else. Did that include the structural cost of, of, of like structural deficit, which we were running in the state of Pennsylvania costs, all those pensions and all those other things go along with it? Well, the manpower was gonna be here whether they were working on the asphalt plant or not. Um, but it did include the hourly labor on, on uh, the fellows that ran the plant. Um, and like I said, it came out to about 15%, and I compared those with... 15 or 50? 15. 15. Um, I compared those with the local manufacturers, um, the people who ran the plants, and they said that's, that's about right because they're making profit, sure. and we're not. Um, the big advantage, and I've explained this uh, to both Johns, um, that if we're going to get out of the asphalt manufacturing business, we're going to have to get out of the paving business too, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't. I'm just saying that you can't you can't pave. I don't believe unless you're making your own asphalt. We have run into situations where you have a failure at the plant with a, a chain breaks or belt breaks or whatever, and now rather than having a crew of 15 guys sitting around under a tree waiting for asphalt, we have to go buy it. Okay, so we send the trucks to one of the local manufacturers to purchase asphalt. The problem there is. We are the little guy, and we're waiting for the trucks that are paving miles and miles and miles of roads on I-90 or I-79 or a, or a uh, other state-maintained highway. Those big triaxles are getting loaded, and our single-axle trucks are pushed off to the side. And they may sit there literally for two hours. Mm -hmm. And during that two hours waiting to get loaded, now those 15 guys are sitting under a creek waiting, to, waiting for asphalt. Yeah. So it's a bad situation. So unless we're going to totally get out of the paving business, we shouldn't get rid of the plant. Um, we've put a lot of money into the plant over the last several years because the town, because the state required us to meet all of their specifications if we're gonna manufacture, manufacture asphalt. Uh, we, the one former supervisor has been in saying, well, you don't even test the stuff. We have to test it regularly to meet, to meet state specifications. We have to meet their specifications for the mix design. We have to have it tested regularly. We have to have people on site, um, um, technicians on site. We have to have technicians, certified technicians in the asphalt plant. We've had to do a lot of things in order to use liquid fuels money to pay for the materials, and that's what we've done. So we have a significant investment in this, and I think that um, uh, the material that we make is, is very good. Um, I'm not going to say that it's the best because we're, me, you're, we're using state specifications and I don't think the state specifications are the best. Um, but um, another study to take a look at the, the, the financial feasibility, hey, go for it. Yeah, because I, I mean, because former supervisor comments and all the current supervisor's comments when he was running and others 
I just want to think, well, it's time we take a look-see at that, put it to bed, and say, hey, we're doing the right thing for Milford Township. I don't have a problem with that. Like I said, I've done this numerous times, and I know where the results are going to go. And to reinforce that, that's fine with me. If I thought that we were blowing money by having our own asphalt plant, I would have gotten rid of it years ago. But I've seen that we're not. I don't think you're biased. I think you're doing the right thing all along. I mean, looking at it and doing it and everything else. Well, I would just like to say a couple of days, whatever it takes, and new eyes such as we have John and Mark and whatever else, get involved, do it, think it through, see where the payback is, when it's going to be, what do we have invested, what are we doing, where's it going, can we deliver them on a road? Because I'm looking at, I'm thinking, well, we should be having outsourced payment, pavers doing that thing in all the roads and coordinating that with all the area and making the thing happen. So we're not the little guy in that queue. We're one of the guys that belongs in that queue and serves when we need to be serviced. Well, and I'll add. I'll add in there that you know, in the geez, like seven weeks I've been in this office, I will say I've been impressed to see um, the efficiency measures that are in place in the streets department, as Mr. McGrath mentioned earlier. Um, you know, bidding out, hauling, and, and materials separately has been a great cost-saving measure. I think that's very important. Uh, the other thing we're, we're trying to do is, um, you know, in the time I spent working for the Erie Metropolitan Planning Organization. Uh, I've been trying to take that knowledge and, and help us find federal resources to pave roads. So I, I, I do think we're on the right track. So I, I don't think it, uh, it's not a criticism to say we, we, we should be evaluating things. I, I think it's, it, there's, there's a tendency to say, you know, there's two, there's two sayings, you know, um, this is the way we've always done it. And the other saying is, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And I think there's somewhere in between there is where we have to try and find solutions to problems. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that you know, Brian's open to looking at that again. And, and I, I hope that we can look at that analysis and say, yes, we are indeed saving the, the taxpayers' money uh, by, hope, by, by uh, operating that plant. I, if, if that's the case, then let's keep doing it. I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know about those two sayings, but my saying is, the way I believe it, change is great. And if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. Right. And you need to go look to see if you're optimizing, optimizing, and optimizing, and then do it one more time. And you know, every time you have a problem, a solution, you have to ask five why. So why are we doing this? Why, why, why? Type Absolutely. Thing. So I think we're all on the same track. I just want to be sure that since I've heard this over the past, that nothing's been taking place. And one of the people who was advocating it is gone, uh, the prior supervisor who retired. And so I just want to make sure it gets done. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sir, if you would uh, sure. state your name and then write it down there on the uh, on the sheet of Michael paper. Michael Michelson, uh, 3104 McKee Road. Okay. Um, I have two issues I want to address. Um, okay. First off, a coworker of mine came to me and uh, told me his bank card had been used online. He used it. And someone stole his identity, charged up $1,000 on it. Um, he went to Erie Police because that's where we work. Uh, they told him he had to come to Mill Creek Police because that's where we live. Mm -hmm. He came here and he was pretty much told that since it's less than $1,000, it would waste more taxpayer money to go after this person mm -hmm. than, than just leave it alone. Um, I, I don't care for that answer. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, the insurance company is going to have to cover whatever was stolen. The, the, my friend will be reimbursed in full, no problem. Okay. But then the insurance company will get to deduct that on their taxes, mm -hmm. and the taxpayers will end up paying either way. Um, okay. You know, we have to go after criminals. That's why we have laws. Mm -hmm. If we don't follow the laws, then, then what's the sense in having them? Mm -hmm. um, my other issue is uh, recycling. We. Uh, we have ordinances in place that you have to keep your lawn eight inches, you know, uh, mm -hmm. for the beautification of our community, we want to keep standards. Mm -hmm. On windy nights, people put out their trash and recycling bins get blown over and there's trash everywhere. Yes. And it's, uh, I don't know if we need to have a new ordinance where lids have to be on those trash cans mm -hmm. or everything has to be put in paper, in plastic bags, clear bags, which is legal. Uh, they'll accept it then. Mm -hmm. so.
Those are my two suggestions. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. If you'd like to give me a call tomorrow at my office here, 833-1111, talk a little more detail about the, uh, the credit card matter. Sure. Okay. I'll try to get some more information for you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else? Any of you students want to get up and say what a great place Mill Creek is? McDowell High School, a great school? <laughs> yeah, okay. Go <laughs> Trojans. Go Trojans. <laughs> okay, well that said, uh, any students that didn't, we didn't sign your paper, that you were here, please come forward. Uh, we'll adjourn the meeting now. I hear the call. So moved. You're watching the Mill Creek Government Channel, powered by WQLN Public Media.